delighted that you are joining us today for the fifth artist talk in Color Talks, which is um, Public Art's monthly series of conversations where we connect virtually with the artists of color fields. UH's first curated exhibition of outdoor sculptures. On view through May 2021, Color Field features 13 large scale works by seven contemporary artists whose variety of different approaches address issues related to color. This evening, the Philadelphia-based artist Odili Donaludita joins me in conversation. Odili is best known for his large-scale works employing color for formal and sociopolitical means. And we are honored to share his unique approach with our audience today. We've planned a 40 to 45 minute conversation followed by a Q&A session at the end. However, please submit your questions at any time through the Q&A chat box and we will do our best to get through as many as, as we can this, this evening. And we're also setting aside some time at the end um, for a quick survey. So we appreciate you taking time to fill it out for us. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, Odili. We are so happy that you're here with us. Thank you for inviting me here to speak with your, your, your audience. So, so you were born in Enugu, Nigeria, but were brought to the American Midwest by your parents when you were only six months old, right after the Biafran War. war. As an American from Puerto Rico myself, um, American by birth, but always kind of seen as different or foreign in some way and whose identity is constantly negotiated, I am really interested in, in your own dual identity as a Nigerian and, and as, Amer as an American. Could you talk about your experience coming of age in this country but living in a Niger in a Nigerian home, How, what was that like for you? Uh, that was really essentially the beginning of, of a double beginning of a understanding of a double consciousness, and I didn't have that term for describing my life experience, but uh, this is what it is. Where um, at home there was one system, uh, the system of of Nigeria, the system of being an Igbo. I'm an Igbo uh, in Nigeria, and uh, we pretty much held on to customs in the household as much as we could within, within the United States. And then outside of that, when I went to school, it was another experience. It was the American experience, let's say, um, you know, going to uh, public school in a, in a very good neighborhood. Um, it was predominantly, uh, 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 I would call it a, a middle to upper middle class uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, mostly uh, Caucasian people. Um, and it was, uh, I could say it was, it was an odd experience for me to grow up there uh, throughout because of the tensions that were existed, not in a, any violent fashion in as much as a few incidents that would have happened to me uh, near my house and, and, and so forth. It was just uh, it's slightly discomforting only because I had the experience in my house of, you know, um, looking at the world rather than say only looking at American issues. And um, I understood the strangeness of things in the sense of, you know, my parents had their accent. They spoke uh, Igbo to themselves, with themselves. Um, and um, just that sense of difference. Kids are so sensitive, so they know all these things that are happening around them. And I had that understanding while I was growing up there as well. So thinking about your own practice, to, to what degree has a permanent sort of personal state of confluence and adaptation influence your, your unique form of artistic expression? And I thought it would be a good moment for, for me to share with our audiences some of, some of your works, um, early works. Yes. You, yeah, I, I, I appreciate your question. I'm sorry, did I interrupt anything no, else? No, no, I was just gonna go through them quickly. Um, there's, we've got three of them and we'll stop on, on, on three slides. We'll stop on the last one which is your more recent work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up certain things, specifically adaptation. Um, that was the experience of, of, of this double consciousness of this reality I was living, uh, being able to adapt to different situations and, and be able to have this confluency of, of to speak and of experience uh, at the blink of an eye. Uh, basically, it was a matter of being able to um, 
accommodate myself to the reality at home, accommodate myself to reality at school, be able to merge them, even if the parties in the different spaces didn't have that kind of contact with each other. So it was definitely a process of trying to just simply understand why this difference existed within my being, within myself and how I saw the world. Um, my work has been a continual investigation of this situation of adaptation, and it's not necessarily a simulation because there's a difference between adapting and assimilating, but it was a matter of being able to experience uh, the with a bit better ease this difference between traveling in one space and then traveling in another. It's like, apologies for my phone in the background, but it's it's like putting on different hats depending on who, where you are and what situation you find yourself in. Exactly. And I kind of see this in, in a lot of this work. The very first slide shows that uh, pretty much uh, uh, ex, ex, extreme, in an extreme way shows this dichotomy. Yet you can see that there's something about it working. And that's what I was always interested. How, does, how, how, can, the, how can different systems come together and work together being different? And I understood over time the strength and the importance of difference, which any corporation, any um, institution, any business will understand that difference makes uh, the, the entity stronger. Did abstraction, how, how did you come, how did you come to um, embrace and abstract language? I know early on, and we'll see some of that work um, in a few minutes, but early on you were doing other work that was not that was photographic and obviously representational. Did, did abstraction in some way influence uh, this process? I mean, there were certain things that are funny about it in school and certain things that are extremely innate. Um, my father was an art historian uh, and, and an artist before that, and an artist now, a uh, painter. He studied uh, painting in uh, Nigeria, and he was part of a very important group in Nigeria called the Zaria art society or the Zaria rebels. And they're noted for wanting to challenge uh, the academic structure of a post-colonial uh, uh, country by wanting to merge more indigenous uh, uh, concerns with urgent and more important Western concerns. They wanted to change the curriculum of the school so they didn't just uh, repeat uh, a kind of European uh, modernism, but rather to make their work pertinent to themselves by speaking to directly to their issues as Africans, as Nigerians, but within that, that continent, within the continent, within the country. So essentially uh, for myself, growing up around all, all of this information, uh, it, 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 just, it just became something like secondhand to me. And that's how I see abstraction right now. Something is as real as anything else. I don't see abstraction as some kind of thing to figure out or some kind of riddle to, to, to solve. It's something that I see as clearly like in this painting, it could be sun rays and the blast of the sun. It could be joy. It could be power and speed. Uh, a lot of different things are coming to me when I see this. I talk, I can even talk about one side having kind of a muted palette, a kind of um, subtle uh, analogous palette. And then the other side speaking about the spark of energy that comes with color contrast. And then we can talk about those things. So. The th way I look at abstraction is to say, what am I seeing and what is it doing? And then from there, you can have a discussion, a dialogue with others, with yourself about what you're seeing, what you're understanding, and how the meaning starts to evolve through the process of looking, thinking, and engaging. So for me, it's like that. And when I think of uh, figuration, to me, figuration becomes something extremely abstract, in my opinion, only because what you have from the very outset of a painting with figures is representation. It is a representation of a thing. So in a sense, it's almost like you can say it's like a copy of something mm -hmm. or it's a manifestation of something else. So when you're talking about something like that, it's saying that the painting of the flowers is not flowers. It's a painting with paint on it representing flowers. You're talking about a split or a move from something from a thing right away conceptually and literally a remove from the real immediately. And you, you, you achieve that kind of, for me, you just said it a moment ago, I think for you, abstraction is very much representational and that sort of 
um, evocative sense. Yes, I mean, it, for me, it's, and I wouldn't necessarily say representation, sorry, abstraction is representation, but for me, when I look at it and through my understanding, and it's just the process of wanting to engage what I see, you'll discover how, how deeply it engages the real world, that it mm -hmm. can engage the real world. Whereas mm -hmm. with figuration, it's all about, to me, I look at it as it's all about the mask. Figuration is all about the mask, what it hides and what is to be revealed in the process of looking. So, so um, speaking of abstraction, um, in your work, I am immediately, what, what immediately strikes me is, of course, the play of geometry, patterning, these are all kind of mainstay devices for you. And they're also, of course, mainstay devices across the contemporary global and also ancestral Africa. But, but in the West, these, these forms have also been met with more rational ideas. And I wondered if you could kind of talk through how you've stitched these two traditions together in your practice. And I'm specifically thinking um, of two things. Um, we see here how for, me, for many people in the West, the Russian constructivists and Malevich in particular were kind of the forefathers of, um, of rationality and modernity in art, but you've also been very interested in how he specifically was looking at, at Russian folklore and, and crafting his own, his own work. Mm -hmm. yeah. At the same time, you're also interested in how, how the Cubists were looking at Africa. So, so this duality is very much a part of, of, of your own work. And I wondered if you could talk to us about it a little bit. I mean, there's a couple of things to say here. I feel like on one hand, um, the rational that you address is 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 really uh, ensconced. It's 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 it permeates uh, folkloric work. It permeates uh, work of antiquity. It permeates um, uh, traditional arts from around the world in the sense that they do speak to society. They do speak to their culture. It's a means of being able to address the reality of the everyday in 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 the lives of the those makers in African art, traditional African art. Um, from the different countries in Africa, you have uh, objects that were referring to kingly things, to uh, uh, the cosmos, to life and to death, to ways in which people interact with each other, to how to how to prepare for uh, the afterlife, if you will. So, uh, and speaking to ancestors. So. All of this work that is understood as maybe not rational by the West is actually misunderstood by the West if people are going to engage that kind of uh, uh, thinking and determination of those objects. And that's the problem with a lot of um, technology and uh, development of cultures and so forth where they deem their inventions masterful over others. And this is the same case for work of traditional, uh, uh, of traditional note, of traditional make, they look at it, people, the experts might look at it as work that's inferior or doesn't, doesn't lack, that lacks a, a kind of a contemporary sophistication. When we have to understand that even as we grow to learn things, uh, we have the same mind and body from eons ago to now. And it's, it doesn't, I believe it doesn't matter that uh, uh, the past of the past and the present is the present. I believe that people are intelligent and can use the tools that are given to them at any given moment in history. So it's to say, I believe that if you had somebody from the past 100, 200 years ago and you just educated them, they would quickly understand everything we're doing now with cell phones and computers and automobiles. So the thing is that it's it's a misnomer to, to talk about uh, um, that th certain things lack rationality and other things have it or rather when they look back at those things all of a sudden this subjective sense of like the 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 um the pure or the unencumbered by social um uh mores or social um um uh, advances and dictates uh uh can can says in the fact that these people might be uh, uh, closer to the earth and purer and so forth, when 
In fact, again, it's all about how people engage their technology and their tools at any given moment in the history of, of humanity. So what I'd like to look at when I'm looking at art from the past to the present is to see the intelligence that exists in what I'm looking at and how, let's say through aesthetics, first of all, how that intelligence is communicated through the way in which they use the tools to make the items or how and what is being how and what has been made is being is depicting the the laws and rules and the social order of their time so it's really all for me it's all about that i'm just looking at information i'm looking at beauty i'm looking at culture i'm looking at the best of these things in any given object whether it's an african object uh, object from here we have the the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, or if we have uh, um, this French painting, Pablo Picasso, uh, this woman of Algiers, made by a Spanish, uh, by a Spaniard. So we can talk about all these different things, and then this, start, this information will start to complicate what we're seeing. And we realize we have to then start thinking more about what we're seeing rather than assume only because this is how we were taught and this is how we repeat. And make these objects relevant to their own context, which own context, and then within, and then yet again, not only their own context is that's very important, but then to see how this these contexts can uh, mirror or show light, new light, insight to what we're experiencing today. Mm -hmm. And that's how you really put these these seemingly disparate trajectories on an equal footing. Once you start to kind of nuance what what they each bring. And it's all about that nuance, being able to tease out the things that are going on rather to just, just to blanket and, and assume for the mere sake of only making your space relevant at the disregard of other space and other people. Right. I mean, could ask somebody now, you see this picture of the, the, this uh, person holding the wax uh, prints, ask somebody, Anybody in your audience, anybody do you know in the neighborhood, go out and make that cloth with that same uh, detail. And you, you, you wouldn't have basically nobody who would know how to do that. That's right. technology, that's a skill right there. Ask somebody to uh, fix a cell phone. Nobody, maybe nobody's gonna be able to do that either, but it's another kind of technology and another kind of skill set that goes into it. So there's, what I'm trying to say is that there's intelligence everywhere. We can't look at one thing and think, think oh, that's just commonplace and I don't wanna worry about that. And then think of, and then see something else and say, that's all we need. People still wear clothing. Yet, mm -hmm. you know, talk about my shirt. I won't know how to make my shirt. There's the cloth right there. I won't know how to make that either. And then we can talk about the nuances of that picture there, that most of those cloth that this person is holding has most likely been made in Europe because they understood and had trade with Africa and these other countries around the world in, uh, in um, Asia, uh, 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 the West and in, in, in Southeast Asia, other places where these European uh, uh, corporations made this cloth and targeted different communities around the world in the buying and selling of this stuff. Well, and even, even before corporate times, as, as our world was becoming smaller through interconnectivity and travel, you know, 400 years ago, there's a lot of cross-pollination in terms of, of technique and also aesthetic designs um, and, and clothing, textiles and clothing are just one, but we see it across the board. And when you look at the cultural production of cities, particularly port cities, you can see that these places blossom because ships came in. Mm -hmm. and people trade it and that's how they and that that's it was a pathway to travel to another land mm -hmm. so here we're looking at three three different images um all of them in their own way having um, a discourse regarding color and i i am reminded of your first new york solo exhibition back in 2000 um, at florence lynch gallery which was titled color theory mm -hmm. Um, which of course this has been something that has been on your mind for, for a very, very long time. There's, there's this long list of Western thinkers who have theorized on color since the 18th century and even before, yet in, in our cultures, color is sometimes more intuitive and, and less rational and often more closely intertwined with personal and even group, group dynamics and identity. 
how, um, how do you see color? And can you walk us through your process for color selection in your own work? And some of which we've seen, seen before and we'll see again shortly. Well, I mean, I, I look at it like this. I'm always thinking about color in the sense of people of color, that this is my consciousness. And the other end of it, I'm looking at color as, as reality, as the, is, it's, it's the world in the round. And what I'm saying in this sense is like, if you look at a black and white movie, you have a sense of the world through the shift of values. You have a sense of the world in the film and what you're seeing and you can identify forms. But when the movie's in color, then I think for myself, it comes to a place of the real. Everything is sumptuous and everything has detail and information. So it's not just a shape on a desk. It becomes an apple on the desk. It's not something that is just uh, dark in the distance. It's maybe uh, a, a man in a suit uh, uh, coming out of a car. That's uh, the thing we're seeing because we can see the colors that identify things. Um, and I, if I have a chance uh, later, I wanna talk about color and how we see it uh, when we get to the flags as well. Okay. Uh, color becomes uh, a local thing in as much as a, as a global thing. Color to me is something that re makes reference to what's around you in as much as can help you to travel into other places and, re and remind you of things that you might've seen or you might've, you might've interacted with. So uh, color has that commonality for me. And then color can also exist on these other levels of narrative levels of the dramatic, the emotional, the psychological, uh, these kinds of things in, a, in, 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 in concert with the, uh, the descriptive as in description of the objects that we have in the world. Okay. So here are our flags, the flags negative space, which are currently installed at the campus of the University of Houston. And I encourage our, our local um, viewers to come out and see this incredible work along with the other works on, on display. They're just fantastic and, and really beautiful. Um, you've actually mentioned to me, so let's, let's, we'll return to this. First, I wanted to talk to you about the work of An Kawara, the Japanese conceptual artist, who you've mentioned to me was an early influence, especially in terms of how he suggested to you this notion of, of a traveling artist. And this is kind of interesting because this was in when you were starting out in the 90s. Um, even before that, we were this was the pre sort of internet era. And his work and male art suggested to you a different way of working, which maybe down the road has, it's also kind of um, inspired you to work on, on works in the public realm. I, I wanted to see if you could talk to us about how your wall works and painted murals that we, that are also very popular when we think about your work, how, how those came about. Yeah, I was when I was a student at Ohio State University, for me, art was pretty much traditional. I had a traditional understanding of art. And for me, it was something that was uh, just normal in the sense of you do sculpture, you do painting. And uh, basically, everything else was uh, surrounds that. And I, I definitely have a more expanded understanding, awareness of art and art making and the interconnectedness of it to how fibers art is, fibers has a relationship to painting in as much as printmaking relates to painting and as much as photography is connected to painting. And as much as sculpture has a kind of di a dialogue with painting, then sculpture has this also this other dialogue with glass and ceramics. So all these different art forms, all these different art disciplines really um, are, are speaking to each other as a whole. And yet also in our education, in my education, I experienced all these disciplines as separate and that they were meant to be seen and, and dealt with separately. And there is an understanding for that in the sense of trying to create expertise, but the expertise is not isolated alone. The expertise mm -hmm. comes to how you can to understand the origins of these disciplines and how they always had a dialogue with each other, meant to be spoken with each other and seen with each other. And so when I think of African bodies or Latin bodies, I think of how uh, color and spaces of color, people, who engage color uh, and cultures that engage color where color is not held on solely on, solely on objects or on, on surfaces, but it's, it's, it's adorned on your body. It's adorned in the house, outside of the house, in the fields, uh, in the way in which you interact with people, 
the color becomes a means of signifying in as much as embracing culture and engaging culture. So I don't have that sense of separation for color in my, in my own practice, nor do, I, um, um, nor do I feel bound by that. And the thing for me is to say with Kawara, and, and as, a, as a college student, I was just motivated by the fact that you could make different things, that artists can make different things outside of this sculpture painting paradigm, and that you can express your life. You can express the experiences of your life outside of this painting and sculpture paradigm. The fact that this conceptual artist was making these postcards and said, as you see here, I got up at 7.57, and then he'd send it to a friend is to me, really mind blowing because it seems so simple, but it means so much. It's the same equivalent of, of a parent calling their children at school or the child calling the parent from school and saying, I'm, I'm awake now. I'm ready to go back to my classes soon. Uh, can you wire, can you, can you send me uh, that thing I, I left at the house, you know, or, you know, um, just humanity, just the interaction of people and interacting with other people. So that was really just striking. And then the simplicity of it too, just sending a postcard and having a banal action become a very monumental uh, action. Then when I saw the date paintings, I was moved by that as well, because this is in a way just like waking up and saying, I'm here today and I did things today and I had possibly a good day. And it's to say, I acknowledge this day. This day acknowledges this painting acknowledges me and my experience this day because every painting that was like this with the date was when it was made. It was not made on May 21st. You could look at it on May 21st. It was not made on May 19th because the May 19th did not happen yet. But on May 20th, 1981, this painting was made. And I believe that he would make concurrent things with it to document the day. Uh, so he had little boxes, little truncates, I believe, to document the day in addition to the painting. So there's a, there's a, there are rituals and cultures and African cultures specifically where you engage in activities daily. Uh, in Catholic church, there are rituals that you engage in those kinds of celebrations there where they speak to existence, they commemorate process of life, and they celebrate the fact that you're alive that day to do that action. We talk about times in the sense that it is now time for, for this season. Today is this day mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church, and you're supposed to do this or that. This happens, sort of cycles of time. Cycles of time, cycles of life. Of life, yeah. And they're so closely intertwined in, in, in many, many different cultures. We have the ritual of daylight savings. We have the ritual of this is the first day of spring. Um, things of this nature are markings in our life that let us know that time is progressing and we're connected not only to the past, but we're going to do this again in the future. Yeah. But in a way, I wonder if your paintings too um, <laughs> reflect that, that temporality, of, temporality of the moment in which you, you've conceived the work as well. I don't know if, if that, thinking about Ankawara An and, and his early influence, I wondered if that is also informs some of your practice. Absolutely. And when I make paintings, I like to title them uh, because I like to remind myself what it was, the motivation and the energy I had in making that painting, uh, making that uh, wall work. Um, there might be other bigger ideas, for example, in, in this uh, piece I have at uh, University of Houston, Negative Space. But they are rec they are the means of recalling all the energy and thought that I put into uh, making something and they mark a time. When I saw the very first painting you showed, I was, I didn't remember that painting uh, for, I haven't remembered that painting in a long while because I haven't seen that painting in a long while. Um, but seeing that I can see certain things that I wasn't aware of then that I'm totally aware of now. And maybe sometime later I'll even see other things, but I'm pretty, um, I was really wild to see that painting because it was really a good painting and I saw many things that didn't even realize at that time that I understand now. You were also mentioning to me when we spoke earlier um, the other day that that for some part of your early career, you were also kind of like torn between recreating what you thought were African colors and the colors that you had come to know um, in the West. And maybe in my mind, more so than maybe other paintings. And I'll, I'll go back. Mm -hmm. work. Here we go. Yeah. 
kind of puts them in direct confrontation, I feel. Yes, I mean, the, there is the, absolutely. Uh, there is the uh, color on the left side, the, the analogous color, the uh, reddish red color, the, um, the magenta type color, the yellow, but the dirty yellow earthy color, and then the earthy orange. And then this very dark, it's not a black, but it's actually was a, like a brown, uh, but it comes off as black. And that's something, one thing as I can say about that is understanding that dark colors, black colors, uh, colors that would be called or understood as black, in fact, are not necessarily there. In fact, they can vibrate as a color. And that tells me, has always told me that we have a sense, one sense of light colors versus another sense of dark colors that in fact, like a gray scale, you would just have variations of value. Uh, like a color scale, let's say, you have variations of light. So a dark color is not the absence of light, it's just another degree of light. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing for a light color. Uh, it's just another degree of, of, of a color, of a light intensity. So here on the left side was my idea, let's say, of African color. And in this sense, I remember being in, um, and you know, going back to Nigeria when I was younger and seeing color and understanding the earth, the clay, Nigeria, the red clay, kind of always the dust of the space, not because it's just dusty like a desert, but because it's open and, and it just gets on things. It's like if you lived on a farm, you would know that that experience of the color of the earth kind of getting everywhere and giving a patina to, yeah. to everything. It happened, that happens to us here in Houston with certain days when it's raining and yes, we that all that dust comes yeah. down and yeah. all our cars turn orange yes. or, or whatever so, it is. This is my idea of African color in the sense of I'm seeing color through the layer of the patina of the earth or through the patina of the dirt. It's not that things are dirty. And in fact, I was always thinking, maybe it's possibly that bright colors are meant to be bright because they stay newer in this space of it's this air of dust covering things, of turning things uh, patina and, and dull, that maybe the bright color is used often so that it has vibrance, it still has life in that, in that space. Mm -hmm. But I had this uh, idea of it in a way in which I limited my color palette. And when I started doing wall paintings, I realized after the process of choosing colors and so forth, for this for this activity that there's no such thing as african color that all color is african color like all color is japanese color like all color mm -hmm. you know um nordic color you know norwegian color you know so it's 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 not about uh color specificity and culture but the fact of how cultures might engage color or how you might as the artist engage the color to uh to create, make a space for yourself, let's say in a, in, a, in a painting or whatever you might be making. So that's in that respect, then I was freed, I felt to be able to use any color I wanted. And in my classes, when I'm teaching students, I really say to them, it's really important to understand that there's no such thing as an ugly color. Let's talk about the colors you, you all often use. And I want you to understand that you're using them out of taste and taste is such a limiting factor in any kind of judgment because it becomes personal in the sense that it's from your family or from your local experience, but it's not branching outward from that. So let's mm -hmm. try to get rid of the notion of your favorite color or ugly colors and understand that every color is beautiful. Another thing, kind of tying, tying, tying to that, you, uh, of course you create works for personal consumption and then also for works that are in the public realm. Is, is your process or approach as an artist different for a commission intended for, pu for public setting? And if so, why, why is that audience important to you? Well, for, for commissions and so forth, I've, I've trained my, I've built my practice to be able to re respond to the situation that, I, that I'm engaging in each, each and every location. Um, I had the experience when I was younger in my career as a, in practice as an artist, when I was writing more and curating exhibitions, uh, that um, I would see artists flying in and out of cities and out of um, uh, biennials and so forth like this around the world, and see that they were coming in almost like jet set celebrities, just coming in, making something or, or bringing something from the studio or from the gallery, showing it and then leaving. And this to me seems slightly impersonal. Just I just thought of it like that. So this seems impersonal. These guys are just coming in, flying in, doing the thing, whining and dining for the time being until the show's over. 
and then until the opening events are over and then flying back to where they're, they're, they're flying back to. And I always felt like maybe it's better to leave something behind, learn something, and then leave something behind to be able to just say, you know what, this experience was real and this is how real it is. And so for me, it built my practice out of that engagement, wanting to be able to learn something where, from where I'm going, take something from the place, take something that, take some of that knowledge for myself and then give something back in the process of it. And this piece in particular was, was that, you know, this is called constellation for the, and it's really, I think a constellation for the three C's. Uh, I grew up in Columbus, then there was the other important city, Cleveland and Cincinnati. And there's this kind of path that, that is across the state of Ohio that it leads from one city to the next, from the top of the state to the mm-hmm. bottom and back again. So, you know, I kind of see these as in a way tire tracks in as much as wings. And there's a, for me, I see a body in the center, this, this, this brown shape in the center becomes like a, a winged angel, okay? a, a, a very important being. Uh, that kind of is spreading their power across this space of the building in as much as to say the space of my of my Ohio, the Ohio I grew up in as a kid. And make, making that connection, connect, connecting us as well. Yeah. So here's just a shot about your, your process. You work with, with a team. Yes. And uh, you mentioned uh, that they're, as impor- they're incredibly important to your, to your work. Yeah, they are. Um, they, they. I have, I have, I make these uh, drawings. I plan the color, uh, and this is what's the difference also between studio work and commissions, in the sense that with the commission, I have to produce the work where there's a facsimile at the end of my production. The the, the space sees what they're getting, and they they understand that this is going to be installed in their in their place. I write a proposal and a theme for uh, the project. I'm not right now, right now I have my uh, negative space uh, statement in front of me and I'm just kind of, wow, I, I just like, I'm surprised at all the work and research I did to uh, produce the piece, uh, negative space and to theorize it and to give a concept and a sense of what everything is going, why everything is there and what's going on with all of it. Uh, so that's the case with that, with that. But then there is the surprise because I always live for that surprise. As an artist, I want that surprise where I, I'm seeing something new as well. And that comes when you, when I feel the experience of the color within a space, and then I start to understand the space that this piece is in a bit better. And I understand what this piece is trying to do and communicating with the space, and I feel the color as real as I would feel the the chair that is under me right now. I want the color to have a physicality and a physical impact in the eye and in the mind that would make somebody feel as if they're looking at a sculptural shape called red white or blue, you know. And in the studio, the paintings, uh, I, I'm a, I allow myself a bit more change and, and manipulation of the space. And when it, that happens, uh, the, the more that happens, it can be frustrating in the sense that the work keeps going and going, but it's the better because I'm searching through my engagement and connection to the work in the process of painting and then changing colors as I, as I go forward with the painting. Okay, so so moving moving right along. So negative space is part of a relatively newer body of work, which I which I know that, and I'll just just briefly show this slide. But I think we, for in the interest of time, we will delve right in. They're part of a, a body of work that you first introduced in two thousand seventeen at Prospect Four in New Orleans. And these specific flags served as as maskers ma- markers for important um, sites in the city, and. Um, your um, negative space, as, as we understand it today here in Houston, is also a nod to this very early work, which is completely different, um, 20 years old, a, more, a little bit more than 20 years old, mm-hmm. 97, 99, and it's black as negative space. This is a photograph where you um, position a black silhouette as a kind of an, an outsider along the periphery of, of the image. And you've mentioned to me that at the time um, when people of color were not as prevalent in mass media as they perhaps are nowadays, the silhouette embodied um, one whose identity is not represented. 
were you thinking about some of these same issues, um, specific to specifically lack of representation and in conceiving negative space, which is now on view at UH? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of similar things that are happening in this work and in the piece at the, um, at the, at the on your campus. Uh, this piece, in fact, um, I'm sorry about that. There's a, this phone will stop ringing in a second. That's oh, okay. Um, this piece is really uh, powerful for me because it actually could be could be made today, yeah. and I can see this piece existing factually today. This is really a, it's a digital work. It's simply a small image I remember like this from a Vogue magazine, and I have to figure out and just put a black piece of paper behind and then shot it and blew it up to this uh, photograph that I have here, that we have here. And it spoke to the, exactly as you said, this sense of separation and disconnection from uh, say Western society or mainstream society uh, and, 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 a, and a kind of situation that dictates, it pretty much speaks to this kind of, this, this white supremacist space as well in this image. Um, the 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 fact of it is that seeing black as a negative space is to understand the way in which I was beginning to see identity politics and engage with identity politics in the in the in the nineties because this was the time frame for understanding that uh, uh, avenue of, of thinking and making in the art world at during that time and so in this case I was not only thinking of myself as an African but as a black person in uh, in in Western culture. And understanding that this image evokes uh, the history of culture, the history of art, the history of, of science, the history of math, the, the, the history of, of education, the history of the world, uh, that is the Western world, where this separation exists on many, so many different levels. So uh, in this piece, it's a, it's a very, comes from a very small place, again, like a magazine image. And to speak, but it speaks towards directly towards this larger issue and this larger concern. And then with the flags, we have even something more complex, in my opinion, where I'm talking about. Uh, and I was, it's coming, you know, artists speak from their experience and then try to grow outward from that. Uh, my family came to the United States uh, after the Biafran War, during the Biafran War, actually, at the start of it, when I was six months old. And, uh, but we were able to come in. And my dad had come to the United States a year before that when he came on scholarship to attend graduate programs uh, in the United States. They talk about being welcomed by people, uh, communities in the university, uh, university uh, graduate students, other people that welcomed them and had them, uh, helped them to, uh, uh, to acclimate into uh, the society, where to send their kids to school, where to live, which neighborhoods are better to live in these kinds of help. So when we had um, um, the last, pre last administration and these rules that were being put into place, uh, the attention of migrant families, the building of this wall, the, the, the detainment of the children, uh, separation of children from families. To me, this is like the most horrendous kind of action you could think about. Who wants to take a family and split them apart? Who wants to take kids from their parents and say, you stay there and this one stays here? Um, it's, it's barbarian. And so I was like, okay, uh, why, if, if my parents had to do everything over in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, do that whole ex exodus over again, I wouldn't have this life here. Now, my parents didn't come here to suck off of the, of the land. They produced. My mother became a lawyer, a realtor, a uh, head of, uh, of, of an office for the state of Ohio. Uh, she did many great things. My father uh, founded the art history, history of African art program at the Ohio State University, uh, could, have been work, could have worked at any university. He studied with the first Africanist in America and got his degree. And he, he, he had 25 plus years of teaching a legion of students who took his courses, a legion of students. He produced, they produced as parents, they gave and contributed to this country. They were not uh, um, uh, uh, coming from uh, any kind of crappy situation as was described in the last administration. So seeing this situation happen to, to these people coming from uh, uh, 
Latin America, from Mexico, and seeing this horrendous behavior, this meanness, was not anything my parents experienced at all. Uh, they were in a positive situation by Americans, treated positively and given help by Americans. So it's to say, why is this happening now? And what's this is about? what is this about? And then to see connections of other kind of despotic action like this around the world in history. We have examples of this, and you can talk about those horrible things that, we, that happened in those times that are in history classes. Then you're going to say, what world are we living in? And so this piece came out of that uh, concern, that emotional concern I had, because I, I experienced war. As a, as a little kid, I didn't see bodies. I had friends who saw that stuff, but I know that war makes people's lives change completely, drastically, forever. And this is what happened. If there was no war, why would my parents uh, live here forever as they have now done? So we had this experience, and um, now I saw this experience happening for other people, and I had to say something. But at the same time, um, the piece is also um, a celebration of the, of the foundational values of America. And I really like how, how you've said it in, in the past. It also is sort of a testament to the precariousness or the fragility of that core, of those core values that all of us who are living and working in the United States so, so dearly um, love and respect. So it's, it's an interesting sort of dichotomy. Absolutely, because there, powerful. there is, um, as you said, there's love here. There's 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 the uh, a avenue for prosperity, the avenue given to people to achieve things with their own hands, to be able to contribute and produce things as great as anybody else can in this space. That is the American ideal and the American dream. And mm -hmm. those A-frames are representing house structures in as much as this kind of x structure where things can change so those things are these poles which are also institutional they're foundational to the structure of how we understand this country and its stature the importance of it and this means they come at they're all lined up together uh on a row the, the balls of the uh, poles at the top are all lined up they're meant to all line up together in this inter in these in their intervals space in their interval spacing to create this idea of sanctuary mm -hmm. uh, of 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 home they also in a way imply something else that they can if you continue the line the imaginary line it can become an x which is cancellation which is um, uh, an inverse of a space an inverse of an idea from positive to negative and that's what happens with the colors of the flags on the flags themselves there's this optical uh, back, optical after effect that happens with the structure of those colors. I made those colors to reflect this other color that is in its essence, its complement or its uh, inverse. Because if you have complementary colors, one knows that the complement of red is green. One knows that the complement of blue is orange and the complement of, of white will be black. So in a certain sense, it's speaking to on many different conceptual plateaus to the idea of what happens when we see what happens with the idea of negative and versus positive and what happens in this transformation of this information so we have a lot of other things as well when we look at objects uh your red jacket i'm seeing that as information given to me but your jacket may not ideally be red everything that when we have light hitting an object it absorbs the object will absorb all the colors yet except for what it doesn't have. What I see as red is what is being reflected back off of your jacket. So it's to say maybe that your, your jacket is the color of its absence, that the red is absent, that it's not necessarily there, but only a reflection. So this is what comes to the idea of what an ideal, what a dream, what a space of prosperity can be, that we can look at it and see it as one thing or it can become something else. So I, I'm going to open it up for questions. There is one question in particular that I think you've just touched upon, but I will phrase it in a slightly different way. It's from Daniel Roman. is asking, um, what role do you see identity politics playing in contemporary art? I think you've done a fabulous work uh, in, in establishing what, how you see it in your own work, but what role does it have um, 
just in our in our art field more broadly? Do you, does it is it relevant? Absolutely, I think it's definitely relevant. It, it, it speaks to uh, it speaks to cultural place and the and cultural expansion. I mean, you have uh, when you talk about identity, you're talking about the localization of experience in as much as how that experience is transformed in the world. Experience is not monolithic, and it's very important. You can have two people in a household, and you have two different experiences that exist there. And we have to then come to understand why might there be two different experiences within a household. And this is where the notions of identity politics comes in because you're gonna speak about the experience of the individuals that makes the truth said from them. And truth also is to be understood as something that is um, 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 seen as group, seen in a group. One person's truth is not necessarily the truth for everybody. Truth is a consensus. People have to come together to accept what is being heard, said, to be able to make it become true. This is what courtrooms are all about. And this is the beauty of a courtroom. You have the judge and you have the jury. They come together to make the truth, to ascertain what the truth is versus what one person says. So as artists, we have to have the ability and strength to be able to manifest our voice in ways in which it can communicate properly, that it can communicate where we are understood by the audience and not just do anything we want and just present anything we want, but the ways in which we can understand how the audience will hear things and then be able to speak from our experiences in ways in which we can communicate those experiences is, is, a, is a really a lot of power of understanding society at large, in, even if in detail. Thank you. I have another question from an anonymous attendee and um... Many of our, much of our public here has had the opportunity, and I hope if, if not, they will make the opportunity to go and see your works, your flags at the campus. But an anonymous attendee is, is asking about the difference in, in terms of viewing experience between the flags and your wall works and, and just traditional paintings. Well, you know, it's it's something I'm thinking about a lot too. With these talks, I have, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, wowed by the fact that the work is very political. I mean, I might not, one might not even think that in any case. I might see color and just see see it as color, and they'll see flags and see it as another thing. But when I think about the motivation for the work and how, what I'm trying to do with my work, it's political in the sense that I'm trying to actually uh, reframe abstraction, and it's not that I said as an undergraduate student, I'm going to reframe abstraction. That's my goal in life. It happens to be that my life experience was, was one that people looked at me and decided who I am. They didn't ask me who I am, they decided who I am. And so just like making an abstract painting and wanting to say something, you have people, art critics, who might say, this is what this person is doing because in history, this object looks like these other things. So we're just gonna say that it's part of these other things. And with my first person, first one person show, I said, no, it's not. That there are other things that I'm thinking about with these paintings to say that these paintings are not those things which I do like, but they're not those things. This painting is this thing. And as I progress as an artist, I had to understand that argument precisely because you have experts who will say to you, no, your, your object is this thing from this kind of place. It's also to understand like uh, art from uh, art by women, art by uh, uh, black people, um, art uh, from people of Latin descent. They might, these experts might again say, oh, your work is, is about this space or in this position or from this perspective of viewing. And you have to say all of these bodies who have to say, no, first of all, we, are, we have history, we have voice. And we're able to now speak from this voice and determine we're going to determine our voice, not something someone outside of our being is going to hit, sit here, stand there and determine our voice. We have the power to represent ourselves. And this is the process, process of what I've done as an artist too, to be able to say my voice, like uh, uh, any other voice, has the right to be heard. And I'm going to have to use my faculties as an artist, my strength as an artist to speak strongly from my position. Because this is the way the world is. You have um, art that's seen as second rate or second class by the mainstream intellectuals only because they don't take the time to be in the space that they're, the space of which they're critiquing. 
and to understand that histories are different from space to space to space. Not every household on one street raises children the same way. Not every household on one street uh, does uh, the similar activities. So let's talk about the local and see that if you're going to understand that that difference exists on one street, how then can you determine a whole cultural group of people or a gender of people and say they see and speak like this? It's, it's, it's so unintelligent that it's beyond belief. That's what many of us has, have spent all of our entire professional careers trying to, to debunk. And I appreciate that, that answer. Yeah. Um, I have another question from Shauna Mohammed, and she is asking about printmaking in your practice. What percent do you engage in printmaking? And if so, what percent of your work has to do with printmaking? I engaged in printmaking as an undergraduate student, uh, but over the years, and I'm starting to make prints now. And for me, it's, it's a fascinating experience because it's a totally different experience than painting. And the way in which you see layers of color being applied, you start actually in a different direction. You start in the same direction, but you think about it in the opposite way. The, the printmaker, in fact, it's understanding the color they want and how to lay down colors to get to that color that they want. With a painter, the painter is coming from the canvas straight up. So there's just different ways in which one can conceptualize the space of making. And then I love printmaking for the idea of layers and flatness because it kind of is my bridge to the screen, not only the movie screen, but most importantly, the computer screen. I'm very interested in the way which I can imagine the computer through printmaking in as much as I'm trying to imagine uh, painting through the computer or the computer through painting. But I think a lot, for me, I personally feel that the printer is closer to the, the space of the computer than, than painting. But it's to say that I'm interested in the technology of these, of these disciplines and interested in manipulating them for myself to be able to further engage the world I live in. Okay. And related to that, I think it, your answer touches upon two other questions. One had to do with um, the difference between traditional painting and digital painting, which I think, um, and, and digital technology, which I think you've addressed. And then another a final question from, from Isaac, he is wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your work, work in the form of flags, but I know that you consider them almost like, kind of like prints in, in, in that sense. So you can talk they're, about they're like, Yeah, they're like prints in this sense, but they're also in relation to the paintings there. I, I, when I first started the project of flags at the, the Prospect Four, I was thinking of flags and representation to like existing flags. And then there was a point in my process of thinking, well, let me think about them like my paintings. Let me think of them as a painterly space. And not that they literally have paint on them, but I wanted to think about the color and the movement of color and line and concept. And then I started to understand that there is a lot of play in the flag work when I think about them in relation, in relation to painting, not in relation to their primal function as say representations of, 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 of landscape or culture scape or political space, but the fact that I can use them as an emotional conceptual space. And that's again, where my play comes in, when I'm free myself of the, of the use value of a form. And I think artists do that when they can free themselves of the literalness the literal, literal use of something and turn it into another thing, then it's a, it's a really a beautiful transformation. And that's the point of creativity. Creativity in the brain, they've mapped it to say that you go from point A to point Z in a specific path. Creativity is finding another pathway to Z from A, not to use the same path that you go from A to Z, but to find a new path or alternate paths to Z from A. That's creativity. Thank you. So we'll close with a question that we have been trying to ask all of our um, artists who have joined us during this long series of conversations. And it has to do, so we are, of course, an institution of higher learning. And we are, there's a lot of students who have joined us today and continue to, to engage. And it is, a, it is a taxing time for many students and leaving them without the structure of an art program and entering a world where they must create and survive on their own. What was that experience like for you? And what advice do you have for those artists who are coming, coming into their own at this time of COVID? Yes, uh, it's, 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 
when I was coming up, it was always this idea of you go to New York or maybe you go to Los Angeles or maybe you go to London or something, a place like that, or Berlin. I think the world is more open because of things like the internet. When I moved to Florida to start teaching at the Florida State University in Tallahassee, some of my friends in New York said, well, you're gonna become history. People are gonna forget that you are a part of this community because art worlds are art, are communities, wherever you are, bigger communities or smaller communities. But with the internet, I realized for the first time, and this is the, the 90s, right? I'm realizing for the first time, you don't necessarily have to be somewhere to exist somewhere because people started to, you know, use the use email and, and things of this nature. When cell phones started to work for us, we started to use cell phones. Of course, I mean, people had, had these shoebox cell phones, but there were not many that had those shoebox cell phones. But when people had cell phones in a, in a way in which you could act, all everybody could have them. And this is in, again, we can talk about the politics of cell phone and cultures that don't get, have access to cell phone or cell phone technology. But when people had access to cell phones, you could actually uh, communicate with someone. And a lot of times the first thing would be like, not how are you, but where are you? Because this idea of location and, and nearness wasn't really, uh, the mainstay. It wasn't really the point. It was like, hello, but where are you? And now we accept that you can be anywhere on a cell call and call anybody around the world because we have this 24 hour kind of existence with that cell phone. One has to now protect themselves from this 24 hour reality of the cell phone, in fact. But that changed the game of everything for this notion of locality, locality, locality. And we began to see in a bigger way that the world is local, that the world becomes local. And with social media now, well beyond the use and experiences I had in the, in the 90s, you see that they become tools for revolution and tools for great change, to be able to warn, uh, alert, save people in calamity, or to actually connect people in, 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 in joy. So, it's, it's, it's our technology, and I'm interested in that, very interested in that, how it transforms our sense of being, but it's our tools and our technology that connects us to who we are as people in our present world, in our present daily experience of living in the world. So for me, it's, that's, that's really what it, what it is. And being an artist, I think young artists, you have many more places to, to go to. I could go to Houston. Houston is a really good place to be an artist, especially when you're young, because you have great institutions there and you have a lot of support there. And you have institutions that are supporting the work. Texas was not a place to go to when I was a younger person, but Texas has changed so much because of the, its diversity. Texas was not as diverse when I was a kid in school, but Texas today is like the growing South. It's almost, um, I can't say it's more diverse or less diverse, but the diversity that exists, the diversity I saw when I was at Florida State was amazing to me. And it's even transcends what I experienced in the two, early 2000s uh, to see and notice the existence and complexity of all the diversity in these, in these places. So a young person has many different options. Um, financially, sometimes that could limit you, but you have a lot of options and you have a lot of way of making and saving and, and, and just ex ex actually, actually exploring your work. I grew as an artist when I lived in Florida and I was able to take that back when I came up to the North in um, Philadelphia. So I, I guess I hear you saying two things. So maybe harness the power in technology because it does help us connect. Yes. People yes. near and far. And then at the same time, do not be afraid of maybe going to places that you wouldn't have thought were necessarily the, the productive spaces for producing your art. Maybe there's a lot of interesting things happening. So many. Yeah. So many. I mean, you don't want to go to a town. I mean, it, it, it depends on you. You can go to a town of five people if that's what you need at a certain point in your life. But the long, the long haul of being in a town of five people might not work. But you have internet and technology that can help you access the world in different ways, in ways in which you can still reach out. But you can definitely go to different places because you're going to get things that 
other people won't have. And when you do eventually go into those bigger places, you'll bring something unique because it's all good. Well, thank you so much, Adili. This has been a wonderful conversation. We really appreciate your time and we're, we're looking forward to um, experiencing the rest of, of the, the span of Colorfield. Yes. And I wanted to ask the people that are in attendance to please fill out a poll and also encourage you to stay, stay current with our social media because we have two more talks coming up in April and in May. Thank you again. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, Adili. It's been a true pleasure. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for hosting Colorfield. It was a really fantastic uh, show, really great experience building the work. And I'm really moved by the fact that it's, the work is affecting people as they experience it. Bye, everybody. And thank you so much.